So you led the OpenAI Robotics team. Can you give an overview of, of the cool things you were able to accomplish? What are you most proud of? So when we started robotics, we knew that actually reinforcement learning works and it is possible to um, solve fairly complicated problems. Uh, like for instance, AlphaGo is an evidence that it is possible to, to build superhuman uh, Go players. Dota 2 is uh, an evidence that it's possible to build superhuman uh, uh, agents playing Dota. So I asked myself a question, you know, what about robots out there? Could we train machines to solve arbitrary tasks in the physical world? Our approach was, I guess, let's pick a complicated problem that if we would solve it, that means that we made some uh, significant progress mm -hmm. in the domain. And then we went after the problem. So um, we noticed that actually the robots out there, they are kind of at the moment optimized per task. So you can have a robot that it's like, if you have a robot opening a battle, it's very likely that the end factor is a battle opener. <laughs> and, uh, and in some sense, that's a hack to be able to solve a task, which yeah. makes any task easier. And I um, ask myself, so what would be a robot that can actually solve many tasks? Yeah. And uh, we concluded that, that uh, like uh, human hands have such a quality that indeed they are, you know, you have five kind of tiny arms attached. Individually, they can manipulate pretty broad spectrum of objects. Mm -hmm. So we went after a uh, single hand, uh, like a trying to solve Rubik's Cube sing single handed. We picked this task because we thought that there is no way to hard code it. And it's also, we picked the robot on which it would be hard to hard code it. And we went after the solution such that it could generalize to other problems. And, and just to clarify, it's one robotic hand solving the Rubik's cube. The hard part is in the solution to the Rubik's cube is the manipulation of the, uh, of like having it not fall out of the hand, having it use the uh, five baby arms to uh, what is it like rotate different parts of the Rubik's cube to, to achieve the solution. Correct. Yeah. So what, uh, what was the hardest part about that? What was the approach taken there? What are you most proud of? Obviously we have like a strong belief in reinforcement learning mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, one path it is to do reinforcement learning in the real world. Other path is to, uh, uh the simulation in some sense, the tricky part about the real world is at the moment, our models, they require a lot of data. Yeah. There is essentially no data. And uh, I did, we decided to go through the path of the simulation and in simulation, you can have infinite amount of data. Mm -hmm. The tricky part is the fidelity of the simulation. And also can you in simulation represent everything that you represent otherwise in the real world. And, you know, it turned out that, uh, that, you know, because there is lack of fidelity, it is possible to that what we what we uh, arrived at is training a model that doesn't solve one simulation, but it actually solves the entire range of simulations, which uh, vary uh, in terms of like uh, what's the exactly the friction of the cube or weight or so, and the uh, single AI that can solve all of them ends up working well with the reality. How do you generate the different simulations? So, uh, you know, there's plenty of parameters out there. We just pick them randomly and, uh, and in simulation model just goes for thousands of years and keeps on solving Rubik's cube in each of them. And the thing is the neural network that we used, it has a memory and as it presses, for instance, the side of the, of the cube, it can sense, oh, that's actually this side was uh, difficult to press, mm -hmm. I should press it stronger. And throughout this process kind of, uh, learns even how to, uh, how to solve this particular instance of the Rubik's cube, like even mass, it's kind of like, a, you know, sometimes when you go to a gym and after, um, after bench press, you try to lift the glass and you kind of forgot, uh, and, and, and your hand goes like a, yeah. up right away because yeah. kind of you, you got used to maybe different weight yeah. and it takes a second to adjust. Yeah. And th this kind of, of a memory, the model gain through the process of uh, interacting with the cube in the simulation. I appreciate you speaking to the audience with the bench press, all the bros in the audience probably working out right now. There's probably somebody listening to this actually doing bench press. Um, so maybe uh, put the bar down and pick up the water bottle and you'll know exactly 
what uh, Wojciech is talking about. Okay, so what uh, what was the hardest part of getting the whole thing to work? So the hardest part is at the moment when it comes to uh, physical work, when it comes to robots, uh, they require maintenance. It's hard to replicate them a million times. Yeah. It's uh, it's also it's hard to replay things exactly. I remember this situation that one guy at our company, he had like a model that performs way better than other models in solving Rubik's Cube. And, uh, you know, we kind of we didn't know what's going on, mm -hmm. why it's that. And uh, it turned out uh, that, you know, he was running it from his laptop that had better CPU mm -hmm. or, uh, or better, or maybe local GPU as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, there was less of a latency and the model was the same. Mm -hmm. And that actually uh, made solving Rubik's Cube more reliable. So in some sense, there might be some saddlebacks like that when it comes to running things in the real world. Uh, even hinting on that, you could imagine that the initial models, you would like to have models which are insanely huge neural networks, mm -hmm. and uh, you would like to give them even more time for thinking. And when you have these real-time systems, uh, then you might be constrained actually by the amount of latency. And uh, ultimately, I would like to build a system that it is worth for you to wait five minutes because it gives you the answer that you are willing to wait for five minutes. So latency is a very unpleasant constraint under which to operate. Correct. And also there is actually one more thing which is tricky about robots. Uh, there is actually uh, no, uh, not much data. So the data that I'm speaking about would be a data of uh, first person experience from the robot mm -hmm. and like a gigabytes of data like that. Mm -hmm. If we would have gigabytes of data like that of robots solving various problems, it would be very easy to make a progress on robotics. And you can see that in case of text or code, there is a lot of data, like a first person perspective data mm -hmm. on writing code. Yeah, so you had this, you mentioned this really interesting idea that if you were to build like a successful robotics company, so OpenAI's mission is much bigger than robotics. This is one of the one of the things you've worked on. But if it was a robotics company, that you wouldn't so quickly dismiss supervised learning. Uh, correct. That you would build a robot that uh, was perhaps what, like, um, an empty shell, like dumb, and it would operate under teleoperation. So you would invest, that's just one way to do it. Invest in human super, like direct human control of the robots as it's learning. And over time, add more and more automation. That's correct. So let's say that's how I would build a robotics company today. Mm -hmm. If I would be building a robotics company, which is, you know, spend $10 million uh, or so recording human trajectories, controlling a robot after you find a thing that the robot should be doing that there's a market fit for, like that you can make a lot of money with that product. Correct, correct. Yeah. Uh, so I would record data and then I would essentially train supervised uh, learning model on it. That might be the path today. Long term, I think that actually what is needed is to train powerful models over video. So um, you have seen maybe and models that can generate images like DALI. Mm -hmm. And people are looking into models generating videos. They're like uh, various algorithmic questions, even how to do it. And it's unclear if there is enough compute for this purpose. But uh, I, I suspect that the models that, which would have a level of understanding of video, same as GPT has a level of understanding of text, could be used uh, to train robots to solve tasks. They would have a lot of common sense. Mm 